It just it says it's now streaming live. The word webinar is so funny. It's like we're in this new word, world, but we're still using the word webinar. Was there a time <laughs> like previously when you used the word webinar? Like maybe there was. There probably was. Oh my God. Was. Are we on? Are we on? We're on. We'll just wait more seconds as people enter the whole space. And once we have critical mass, um, hello everyone out there. We'll in with our speakers. Um, looks like we're red. We're slowing down here. Um, hi everyone, I'm Julia, a bookseller on Crows. We're live, Patricia Lockwood and Gia Tolentino. Just no talking about this. You can find a link at to get your copy directly at Politicos. If you have a question for our speakers, make sure you put that in the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions in the last part of the discussion, but we apologize in advance if we run short on time. Before we get started, we thank all of you out there for joining us. Really grateful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business experience afloat. Now it's my pleasure to introduce this great book. In Patricia Lockwood's No One Is Talking About This, a woman who has recently been elevated to prominent media posts travels around the world to meet her adoring fans. She is overwhelmed by navigating the new language and etiquette of what she terms the portal, where she grapples with an unshakable conviction that a vast chorus of voices is now dictating her thoughts. When existential threats from climate change and economic precariousness to the rise of an unnamed dictator, an epidemic of loneliness begin to loom, she posts her way deeper into the portal's void. An avalanche of images, details, and references accumulate to form a landscape that is post-sense, post-irony, post-everything. Are we in hell? The people of the portal ask themselves. Are we all just going to keep doing this until we die? Suddenly, two texts from her mother pierce the fray. Something has gone wrong, and how soon can you get here? As real life and its stakes collide with the increasingly absurd antics of the portal, the woman confronts a world that seems to contain both an abundance of proof that there is goodness, empathy, and justice in the universe, and a deluge of evidence to the contrary. Lockwood will be in conversation with Gia Tolentino, a staff writer at The New Yorker and author of the best-selling essay collection, Trick Mirror. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Patricia Lockwood and Gia Tolentino. Thank you both. Thank you, Julia. That was wonderful. That was really good. We really got in there. I like when it was, it makes it seem like there's like a turn or something or like there's a- What do you mean makes it seem like there's a turn? <laughs> I tried to be fairly open about this actually because it's like, you don't want to scare anyone. So I'm like, the main thing I'm going to do is have a huge excerpt run in the New Yorker. That's how I'm going to plan it so that everyone knows what's going on. But yes. Oh, and before we begin, I'm supposed to say that, uh, if while we are talking and you are listening to us talk, you uh, tweet a picture that you have drawn of my cat Miette uh, and tag it with the politics pros handle, you might be entered to win a shout out. And I have no idea what that's going to look like. And we're just going to free ball that and decide that later. Um, and or a signed illustration of Miette. So just like draw something horrible and tweet it at politics and pros and make it my cat. Happy release day. Thank you, thank you. That I Well, my husband said that to me, but then you're the first real person. As I well. feel like we should all clap. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I sort of like, I'm, I feel like my soul is reaching out toward the people that I know are out there and I do wish that I could see them a little bit. It is nice that we're kind of creepily in people's kitchens and yeah. you know on their couches right now. We're we're fucking in here with you guys. It's dinner time. <laughs> it's yum, dinner yum. time. Scoot it up. Like so okay, I have something to confess which is that like I have not been doing a lot of these Zooms of other, there's so many, like a rich cultural array of these things. And every night I'm not doing that. I'm watching Star Trek The Next Generation or, well, I previously was watching Buffy and Angel, but I kind of had to little, put a little pause on that because we uh -huh. had, there was like a major moment and I'm like, let's just watch something else for now. But that's what I've been doing instead of like the rich cultural array of things. Yeah, I have been, uh... 
I've been doing, like when I think about the last year, I'm like, what have I been doing? I haven't been, been staring at a wall, but okay, before I start asking you questions, I have to, I have to say, I mean, as you know, as probably anyone who has seen the my blurb on the back of this book, which is like someone's head exploding uh, just over and over and over and over again. This is my favorite novel, I think, that's coming out this year. And, you know, I, I still remember you, you sent it to me very cautiously, like a week before I was about to have my baby. And you were like, I don't know if you want to read this. Yeah, and I was, but it was, I was just this like thunderstorm of hormones, like this big fluffy cloud full of you know, I was already wondering about all the things that are in this book, like whether life is tenacious or whether it is vanishing or, you know, thinking about the link between abundance and grief, which is what I spent so much of the COVID era thinking about. And, you know, thinking about the Schrodinger's cat situation that was about to burst out of my butthole or whatever. And um, and, it did, <laughs> and, it did, and, it <laughs> and I had just gotten off Twitter for the first time since 2012. And I was just so stunned. I mean, everyone who knows your work knows you can do something with language that, you know, I, it was it was a reminder of how much more is possible with a line, how you can do 10, 10, 12, 20 things with it at the same time. And yeah, I just think this book is, is just so fucking phenomenal. It's like you're, the narrator is fumbling with this existential veil, it's slapping her in the face constantly. And there's this behind the most important things in the world and the least important things in the world, there's still a sense of wonder and fragility, this miracle of being able to perceive. Um, and I reread the book last week with my, with the, you know, my terrible baby suckling at my terrible teeth and I cried oh, again and I, was, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just, I mean, this, the question that this whole book circles, you know, what does it mean that we're able, what does it mean that we're here even for a second? What does it mean to have access to knowledge that we didn't necessarily want, that we shouldn't have had, but that we're so grateful to have had? And so before we start our conversation, I was wondering if you could read the section I begged you to read from the internet part. Yes, which no, you did not. You just said a part, but thank you for all of those extremely, very sweet, um, perceptive, I would like to think, since you're saying that my book is good, things that you just said about my book, yes. <laughs> so I'm gonna read a little bit farther in and then I'm going to take drugs because that was my promise. I have drugs in a Flintstones mug um, that I will drink. Is that like a femur on the handle? Like It is, is, yeah, it's a dinosaur bone oh, that you grip it by. Um, and the drugs are already ready, they're already in there, so I'll read this and, and then I'll go to town. And you yourself are, are on drugs now. A little bit, yeah. A little bit, you're a little bit on drugs. Pleasantly unnerving. <laughs> <laughs> How else are you supposed to do this at dinner time? <laughs> All right. Perfect politics. She hooted into a hot microphone at a public library. She had been lightly criticized for her incomplete understanding of the Spanish Civil War that week, and the memory of it still smarted. Perfect politics will manifest on Earth as a raccoon with a scab for a face. Every day we were seeing new evidence that suggested it was the portal that had allowed the dictator to rise to power. This was humiliating. It would be like discovering that the Vietnam War was secretly caused by ham radios, or that Napoleon was operating exclusively on the advice of a parrot named Brian. Some people were very excited to care about Russia again. Others were not going to do it no matter what, because above all else, the Cold War had been embarrassing. Not just the ideas, but the genes. In contrast with her generation, which had spent most of its time online learning to code so that it could add crude butterfly animations to the backgrounds of its web logs, the generation immediately following it spent most of its time online making incredibly bigoted jokes in order to laugh at the idiots who were stupid enough to think that they meant it. Except after a while they did mean it, and then somehow at the end of it they were Nazis. Was this always how it happened? To future historians, nothing will explain our behavior except, and hear me out, a mass outbreak of ergotism caused by contaminated rye stores. Every time it was in the news, she had it again, the dream where her rapist was being nice to her. He was next to her on the bed and speaking quietly, and she understood that it had all been a misunderstanding, which wiped with an unbearably fine cloth 
something in the body away from the mind. And once that was gone, they moved together through the dream as the two closest people on earth. Though no one she encountered understood, though mouths of friends and family fell open with soft shock when they saw her. The word toxic had been anointed and now could not go back to being a regular word. It was like a person becoming famous. They would never have a normal lunch again, would never eat a cob salad outdoors without tasting the full awareness of what they were. Toxic, labor, discourse, normalize. Don't normalize it, we shouted at each other. But all we were normalizing was the use of the word normalize, which sounded like the action of a ray gun wielded by a guy named Norm to make everyone around him norm as well. When Caucasian blink dot gif appeared, her eye traveled over it left to right as if it were 100,000 words. The little strings that connect human eyes to human eyes and human mouths to human mouths tugged her along with the expression. She bounced her eyebrows, bobbed her head back on its neck and blinked along. Sometimes she even made a sound that corresponded with the figure of movement, a hushed zoom or a whoop that rose and fell with the arc of the drama. It was no longer the embarrassing adolescent question of whether people saw the same color green. It was a question of what soft formless, excuse me, Linda, what the fuck did you just say, played out in your innermost ear when the Caucasian man appeared in the portal and asked you to help him put on his never ending play. Just this once more, please. You were the only one who could help him bring to life this masterpiece of universal fear. Can you make the sound that you imagine that it's, gift makes? It's What's almost as much of a movement as a sound is like whoop. It's almost like the pluck the thing or the little duck that drinks the water. Does that make a sound? That's yeah. the sound of it to me. Yeah. But it is. And then I think, oh, something's wrong with my brain. Like I have synesthesia or something, or some sort of more of a sympathetic reaction to to watching images. It's also weird because like we know who that fucking guy is now, you know? There yeah. were times in the past that we did not know and now we have the knowledge of who that man is and that brings something else uh, to bear on the experience as well, right? But it's like it's like a yawn, like every time, you know, it you're yeah, you're you're meant to yeah. to yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, but it is, it is like a sympathetic response. You're seeing like another like human monkey do that thing. And you're also doing that. But for me, I always had like an extreme response to that kind of thing, which is why I like the Muppets so much because like when I watch the Muppets go across the screen, that's very, very real to me. And I was watching Muppets Christmas Carol at uh, Christmas time. And I was asking Jason whether he felt that because he hates the Muppets. And I was Does like, not? how can you hate the Muppets? Don't you feel them moving? Don't you feel these little guys moving, you know, through your mind as you watch them? And he's like, yeah, I do. And I can feel them getting dirty. <laughs> he's like, I feel the Muppets getting dirty. Oh no. <laughs> and it really bothers him. He's like, I didn't know that there was more than one Kermit. I thought there was just one and that we could ruin him. And that caused me a lot of anxiety as a child. So not oh, everyone man. responds this way. He's not on Twitter. And maybe that's why. Maybe he would be seeing all the gifts and be like, oh God, that guy's getting so dirty every time it plays in the portal and everyone has to look at him and do the hushed zoom and the whoop. Oh my God, I, I can't think about Muppets getting dirty. I'm gonna, I'm gonna spiral. Okay, that's gonna take you all the way down the loop. But I'm, I'll drink my drug now while you ask my next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, like, if you could walk us through the timing of when you started the book, when you finished the book, and how that intersected with COVID. Interesting, interesting. So I had a little bit of a feeling just now as I was choosing my readings where I opened it up and I was flipping through just for something to read. And I was like, oh no, I have to throw this book away. I have to uh, get all the copies in the world and make sure that they're burned because I, I have to throw this book out. Yeah. And it's because I was revising it when I actively had COVID. I was like editing it for print as I had yeah. COVID. But I started writing it um, in spring of 2017. Mm -hmm. So we had kind of, gotten past that initial shock. So David S. Pumpkins happened and there was, yeah, I know, I know, think about it. There was a line in the book for a while that was like, if you said 
you know, David S. Pumpkins was the last normal thing that happened. How many people would know what you meant and for how long? But like I say to you and you understand what that means. Um, yeah. And so then there was the election. We had sort of uh, gotten onto a different footing with it. I think we were um, paying attention to it in a different way. Like, I don't think that it had calmed down. I think that the observation had actually become more frenzied. Mm -hmm. And it, it started in that period. Um, and it, it's because I was reading a Rachel Ingalls book, uh, which is a very literary way to begin your book. I was reading Mrs. Caliban while we were moving apartments and I did not want to help my husband because I'm a huge bitch who does not help. And I was hiding and I had Mrs. Caliban and there was something about just this daily recounting, you know, like her, her arms are in the dishwater and she's listening to the radio and she hears these sort of strange bulletins, you know, that a creature has escaped from the Institute. And there's something about the recounting of it. It's Rachel Ingalls is very interesting where her individual sentences, you don't necessarily pay attention to those, but she creates this kind of like rhythm of an afternoon Mm -hmm. specifically of an afternoon, I think, of, of some sort of dailiness that made me think, well, I could write down what happens to me in my day. Yeah. My day is all fucked up and fake. Uh, so, but maybe I could try to write that too. Yeah. And then you were revising it during COVID and I'm sure you felt completely normal and good. Oh. So good, it felt absolutely good. Yes, I have, I did tell people that I was, uh, I tried to add a little like 200 word paragraph about peeing next to Rob Roy's grave. Mm. I tried to add this to the book for like months and months and months. And I was like, I know it can go in. It's so important. If this part about Rob Roy and me peeing next to Rob Roy's grave is not in the book, then the book will fail. Everything about it will come apart. It has to go in. Of course it didn't go in because it didn't make any sense to you. It was, it was actually quite interesting because I was having a lot of neurological issues with the COVID. And so I wrote something that seemed basically in form like the rest of the paragraphs in the book, but that was missing some sort of crucial leap of information or some, um, you know, some some cohesion, like it just did not appear. So going back, I think it's actually very interesting to look at, like, why do these things work when they do work? And why do they not when they don't? Yeah, I was wondering about, you know, so you write in the book in the second section, the or the narrator and her sister are parsing the sort of infinitesimal likelihood of this very particular syndrome manifesting in this, this specific child. And you write about this sort of being awed by the realization that mostly the body functions, that yeah. it, you were saying, I think you, you, mostly the mercury flies together. And I was wondering, did you still feel that way during COVID? Oh, that's so interesting. This is a really good question. I think everyone that I've spoken to who had COVID, um, even people who had really mild illnesses said that there was one point where their body <laughs> told them that it was okay to die. And, and they were like, I basically had a cold. And then at one point I woke up at 3 a.m. and my body told me that it was okay to die. And everyone I talked to who had it had the same experience. And I really wondered about that. I was like, I wonder if it's because it's like this brand new illness. Like it flew mm. directly out of a bat. Oh, I have a present for you. Oh, it's the COVID bat. It's the original COVID bat. Original COVID bat. This gave it to me. Wow. First, yeah, it flew into my mouth and that is how I got it. But yes. Oh, it's so of, sweet of you to keep them around. It's really, really hyper realistic. Like <laughs> little face. I know he's really, really great. I love him. So anyway, that's the COVID bat. Yeah. And he's the guy. Incredible. Who yeah, so it, it, I think it was like the body encountering something new and you're like, oh, it's okay if I die. It was almost like reassuring your body's like, it is okay if I die. Mm -hmm. um, and then you make it through. And I had a period of probably like a couple of weeks of total euphoria where I was just like, I fucking lived, bitch. Like I made it through. And yeah, there was that sense that the body makes it through things that yeah. there, I don't know. There, yeah, this, this... <laughs> The mercury image I just really liked because it does, there's this determination about it just to, mm -hmm. to move back into this like single shining pool. Yeah, the, the when you use the word absolutism about the, the babies herself are making themselves into whatever they were gonna be, there is this, yeah, it's wild. But I was wondering, I mean, so there, there are two times that you, you, the person, not the narrator, um, sort of left and re-entered the internet, right? Like when you were immersed in 
this time with your family, with the, you know, the events that the book is drawn from, and then re-entering the internet after COVID. And I know you were kind of on it a little bit, tripping out a little bit over, what was it like a picture of Garfield in the hot tub? I feel like I- Yes, it was like, it was like Bart Simpson t-shirts. And <laughs> I was trying to reconstruct, like I did see people, like I saw the cancellations of the day and I was trying to work backward and figure them out and I could not do it. And then it, the situation became so serious um, when George Floyd was murdered and there were the yeah. protests all over the country and I could not, follow them. I could yeah. not take in the information that I felt I really needed to take in. So I thought I need to be off it for right yeah. now. Yeah, no, I had several periods. And before that I had periods as well, where things were happening in my family, you know, like my little brother had an accident and was in the hospital and we all went to Kansas city to be with him. And you can't really be on your phone in that way. You can't be on the phone, uh, you know, when you're in the hospital, you can't, it's not the same. There's this sensation of wealth, I think, that was present in our lives before, probably before COVID, where it was just like, you're just like sliding down this slope of money all the way to the bottom. And you were never gonna reach the bottom really. And, and that was time, that was being alive and you were free to spend it this way. And it felt good to do that, right? And it felt like there was some accumulation or you were making use of some accumulation uh, for your own freedom, for your own velocity. And that's how it felt. And then gradually it came to seem very different, you know, when you're on the, the slopes of real life, um, when you are in that situation of urgency. You can't really do like you can't be doing that you know you maybe can check your phone when you like go to the bathroom or something like that but it isn't the same you can't live on there yeah. not the way you used to but for you as someone who is you know like intellectually and critically and also personally invested in kind of i mean this is one thing that i i'm wondering about the points of re-entry and if the re-entry is getting harder and harder as arguably the internet is getting worse right like right. more full of trash no yeah that is a really good question because it does feel like why am i on twitter right now i'm on twitter because i have a fucking book coming out right i mean that's that's unfortunate came out today yeah. <laughs> it came out. and you have to i mean people write about your book people yeah. interview you people this is their work, you know, people, uh, you have to honor the work that people do. And, and, you know, it's also, it's, it's like part of the whole deal, you know, when you Their have a deal. Up, this is, this is what you do. And it has felt strange. And I, I had a very odd experience with it. Like, I think I had to sort of relearn how to be interviewed. So I started yeah like just two days, I think, before the coup. <laughs> and um, I had this photo shoot where I was like outside in 30 degree weather for like two hours. And I came back and I was like shaking for hours. And clearly after that was not feeling that great, but was still pushing through all this stuff. And then it's like, you know, the the wolf shaman is, is storming the Capitol and all of that was happening as well. And I sort of like, after the first couple of interviews was like, oh, I don't know if I remember how to do this. It was sort of that sensation of during the pandemic um, when you would go into a store as you very rarely do, or you would get your hair cut very rarely or something like that. And suddenly you were telling the person you were interacting with your entire life story because you were completely emotionally dysregulated. Right. You had no protection. You were just telling any person you encountered everything. Like, I don't even say hi normally anymore. Oh, right? I've, I've, like, if someone says hi to me, I'm like, you too. Or like some, yeah. something way worse, just something a lot a lot less uh, competent like you don't have normal conversations anymore so how was I supposed to have these slick professionalized glib conversations that I was used to having that I had become very good at uh, peak performance <laughs> that I had reached uh, like many years before that I just this had been a talent of mine and suddenly that sort of conversation was not really possible and something else had to happen. I had to sort of make my way toward a new kind of conversation, I think, with my interviewers. Yeah, and there can be, I remember I was off the internet. I, I was in the Peace Corps for a year and didn't have internet. And when I came back, it was the year of the, like that meme started to happen, really. Oh, like the year, was, wait, it was what a big year. 20, what, 20, what did you say that was? 2011, 2010-ish. 2010, was like double okay. rainbow guy, you know, bed intruder was like the really early memes but it's the the slickness of the internet the like like you say the kind of the infinite sort of rushing momentum this eternal present this this wealth of not of, of of 
nonsense. Like there can be such pleasure in it, but when you are re-entering that, the physics of that world, it can feel like, I remember having a really visceral reaction to it. Like I'm like almost a heartbroken one. Like I'm never going to be able to speak this language. Like I'm never going to step into this world and feel like this, you know, shimmering poisonous air is normal. But of course it gets normal very quickly, the longer. Right. That they really do become acclimated quite quickly. Quite quickly, you know, but have you, I mean, what was, have you felt that, that the internet is like, what was the last meme that was really doing it for you? I can't even, I mean, I think the coronavirus meme of all the Republicans having it was like, right, the, the, the really events of real it. life in which, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I always enjoyed memes in the same way that other people did because they required um, that, that sort of participation that always makes me feel a little bit prickly that I have to step outside of a little bit sure. and then prefer to actually watch, but it yeah. has, it has been a while and um, it doesn't feel feel easy to re-enter it now but part of that is because it is like class if you miss sessions yeah just these holes and there are things I was on Twitter a couple weeks ago um and I I was talking to an interviewer about this but the (laughs) they were like happy anniversary to the Jeff Bezos uh sex day where Uh I love you alive girl alive girl alive girl (laughs) and I was like why don't I remember that? I had no uh-huh. memory, but it was almost like a, a eternal sunshine of a spotless mind situation where it was like, it had been surgically removed. I was like, what, when did that happen? And it was like two days before my niece passed away. Right. I was like, that's why I didn't know about the Jeff Bezos. I love you alive girl, which is like actually quite beautiful in juxtaposition, but it's why I didn't know. And I think the more of those days you accumulate, the more difficult it becomes to just enter back in because there is this feeling of athletic freedom. You're stretching, yeah. you know, your, your limbs and your strength. Um, you're exercising to a certain degree, a kind of agility, a kind of nimbleness. And when you don't feel that you have that, you you become kind of like a creaking older person also if you've had COVID that has like affected you neurologically you're like oh god and you go back <laughs> and it's 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 different and I think maybe that's where you get to the point where it's like oh yeah we do all have the MySpace day where it's the last day we do all have the last yeah. day we sign on to instant messenger and yeah. that is going to come for this Yeah. I it's, I've been off since July, even though like I was telling you in an email, like I got on back on the night that Trump got COVID just so that I could feel that feeling. So much. And then they tease us. They come out with the story that's like, Oh, he was a lot sicker than anyone knew. And I'm like, fuck you, fuck you. And we knew how sick he was because he was like, you know, he was breathing in that way. And a lot of people were like, I had so much physical sympathy for him in that moment. Mm. That was weird. So that was a lot of people experienced that Just even like if I had it I mean my whole beat is like take that man down but I had had COVID and I was like oh mm. I need that feeling it was it was very well, horrible it's funny to think of your sort of your psychosomatic response to blinking man and Trump heaving for COVID I mean we are creatures like we're our synapses are going to do what they're going to do and there's something I mean this what you were talking about missing I you know I love you alive girl two days before your niece died I mean this is the this is the kind of incomprehensible simultaneity of being alive that your book is about. The fact that, you know, on any given day, we can be reading Jeff Bezos's sex to his alive girl, or we can be witnessing life and death, <laughs> you yeah. know, like we can be witnessing yeah. these things that are, and, and the scale of that coexistence and what it does to our mind and how we process events and knowledge. I mean, I kind of think that it's the thing that, you know, I've been, it's, that is the feeling of what it's like to be alive and why we all feel insane <laughs> often. Yeah, underline it right there. But yeah, I was really interested in in frivolity, I think, because I always had a sense, and I think a lot of people do too, that there are certain things that belong in a book and, and certain things that don't. And if we had been alive in Emma Bovary's day, we would be having that experience. We would be living Emma Bovary's life and we would be dying with this really grand finale and instead it's we are experiencing these days that you think we would have been you think if we were in Emma Bovary's life we wouldn't have been talking about rat shit and I mean we would be talking about rat shit that's the whole thing it's just with with the distance that that becomes 
uh, sort of ossified or it becomes it made grand, I guess, like monumentalized is a better word than ossified. If we're going in on stone words <laughs> and we've had a little bit of drug and should probably drink the rest. <laughs> But yeah, so so you this is what makes something permanent. It is what allows you to to build a monument to you know temporal life, is putting in that detail. You know, if you're if you're making your column, you can choose the really basic model, or you can go full Corinthian, right? And like make sure those little leaves are in there. Well, let's let's talk about the second half of the book since we were talking about your niece. Um, and I, f I feel like, you know, it's the book's release day and we should spend a moment just paying tribute to her existence. I think so too. And I think that's really yeah. beautiful. And I have um, my stone that I would always carry around um, that, I don't know, I just chose it thinking of her and I would always bring it around with me. Um, so I have that here with me. And when you were with her? It was actually after, it was after she passed away. It just sort yeah. of reminded me of her. Um, I don't know, it's, it's yeah, it, it was comforting to carry around. And then it was funny too, because in the book, it's like, she had a crystal egg up her vagina. In reality, I know so much about crystals and I know that is always a terrible idea. Uh, many crystals are not meant to be put directly into your vagina, but then there was kind of like this harmony. It was like, I am carrying around like this crystal egg, you know, it's like reminding me of my niece. I have this part in my book that is kind of like, okay, really? <laughs> like, And it all seemed to, I don't know, be woven together. Before you read a, a section for the second one, I want from the second part. I wanted to ask you. I mean, like you write in the acknowledgments that that she didn't come here to teach you, but you learned. And there's something very like again the thing that made me fucking weep when I read it again a couple of days ago. This this thing of she wasn't supposed to be able to do any of the things that she was able to do. She wasn't supposed, you know, based on the diagnosis, based on her genetic sequencing she was not supposed to be able to breastfeed to play yeah. patty cake you know and 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 there's a way in which this is one of the many kind of uncanny devastating echoes between the halves of the book this question of like these things that we were never supposed to know we were never supposed to see someone's balls on the internet there, there's this that's the, exactly the what we were supposed to see on the fucking internet. That's what it's there for. It's balls, balls, balls. But yes, yes. But, but I wonder if you could talk about what it was like, like to, you know, to be confronting vis-a-vis -vis the internet for many years, the question of access to more knowledge than has ever been possible in human life, this excess, this unbelievable, unnatural, you could say, but also incredibly human excess. And then watching your niece go through that, through having to rework your understanding of consciousness and knowledge through her. And it was simultaneous sometimes. You would be, you know, hearing heartbreaking news. You would be looking a little to the right and seeing a tear slide down your sister's face. And then you would be looking at the projection, which, uh, you know, was a picture of the baby's brain, which was something absolutely abstract. And you were being told these facts about it, but it was, it was miraculous. You were still looking at it. And my niece particularly uh, had Proteus syndrome, which is a, an overgrowth syndrome. And it's not usually symmetrical. So one side you would experience overgrowth in, she had, um, her middle fingers sort of grew like a, like moths um, antennae. Uh, and again, it, it was, it's lovely, you know, like objectively speaking, lovely. But so she had overgrowth in her brain and she also had something called polymicrogyria, which is um, where the neurons, basically the, the brain created too many folds. The neurons like all migrated into these isolated pods where they would never talk to each other is what I say in the book. And it was one of those things where you hear it and you're a writer and you're like, it's not metaphorical. This is not like, it has nothing to do with my book about the fucking internet that I'm writing and how we're all making too many connections and how there's too much overgrowth in the communal brain. It has nothing to fucking do with that. You know, it is, it's just, it's her, you know, glowing up there on the screen. Um, but you were able to observe both of those things. Um, and, what they told us, of course, is that she, you know, would not be like born alive. And so that is the, the first and most basic hurdle, right? Uh, and then I think it was the day before one of her doctors, and it was one of her female doctors, because she had some male doctors um, who were a little bit more brutal in their diagnoses. The female doctor said, I think that she 
I think she's going to come out and I think that she is going to cry. And, and that is what happened. And from there, uh, it was just like watching a flowering and it was, um, yeah, you had to, you had to be sure that at no point were you ogling her, making her your material, um, making use of her in that way. But to watch her was such a splendid privilege. And um, you could bring her things, you could bring her the things of the world, you could bring her music, you could bring her flowers. And it was just your privilege to be able to do that. Um, and it felt too, I think anyone who's experienced this sort of thing knows that then you discover the world anew as well. You're bringing those things to yourself, you're seeing her comprehend them, perceive them, you're comprehending them, you're perceiving them. Um, and yeah, all throughout that, I was writing because I, I did have to show someone that I had to set that down in some way, because it was just so simply remarkable. And because it showed me something about the world. Yeah. Well, it's the, the simple fact of being able to show someone something. I mean, you're right. I mean, like, it's not, it is a miracle to be able to perceive anything about the world at all. And I think that watching a brain turn on, especially one that, you know, was not supposed to be able to do these things. It is like, there's a way that a baby sort of reduces the miracle of consciousness to this immediate animal, Yeah, you know, um, thing that, and there, you know, there's 35 million sort of recursive dimensions later, we're looking at pictures of balls on the internet and, you know, we're, and, 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 but, but at that extreme too, it is a miracle. Yeah, no, it starts, it starts with that moment. It starts with that very simple flowering. And maybe that is again, why it feels like wealth to be able to, to go into the portal and like, look at the flowers there. I mean, yeah. Like these, these are things that we are able to do. And it starts from that very, very simple point that we right. come out and we cry. Yeah. Um, I, I try to forget. I mean, I've had a harder time finding, like I used to have fun on the internet so easily. Like I was, you know, like it was, it was fun. And I was always, you know, I wrote part of what I would write about was how the internet was bad. But I was like, as long as I'm still having more fun on it, then I'm not, you know, like it'll be fine. But I've, had a harder time lately having as much fun on it, but I keep trying to remember that it is still a miracle that like there was that little website during COVID where you could look out other other people's windows. Yeah. And you know, and it's like these, it's a miracle. Um, yeah. And I think that's why there's no takeaway. It's like, well, f throw your phone in the river. Like, right, right. Oh, I challenge you to do this because that isn't the takeaway. Yeah. And at the very end of the novel, you know, her phone is, is stolen out of her back pocket and she thinks, oh, you know, someone is going to, to try to turn it on. They're going to, to see my niece his face they're going to see my great love you know bounded in this little frame and she's free of her phone for what how long what's the first thing you do after you get your phone stolen you get another fucking phone so there's no it's like lifting off the ground with my new freedom no like you you are just going to get another phone so that's how that works yeah yeah, yeah so there's no uh, it's I, I wouldn't say that there's a moral lesson. I mean, well, the moral lesson, I guess, could be really fucked up. But yeah, there's 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 nothing like that of the kind, I think. And I think it's more of the lesson in the book that like we have to use the things we find in those places for the life de life and death purposes. Like we have to consider the purposes to which they can be turned. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's this line that I um, like will always think about when the sister in the book says, "I would have done it for a million years." Like the yeah, when it the question of like it is it is worth it to be able to show someone things yeah. and to allow like yeah perception also, to go yeah. 
also just to help. I mean, part of yeah. the reason I, you know, I, I was, I was doing all this like very fancy observing and stuff, but part of it was there, I was fucking helping, yeah. you know, like it was boots on the ground. Um, you know, someone needs to take this shift at the hospital. It's not like I could drive anywhere or do anything actually useful, but I could do some stuff, you know, I, I could be there and I could be there for my sister and I could be there for the child and I could just be another pair of hands. So yeah, there, there was all this beautiful observation observation, but it was secondary to the fact that like we have utility in the world. We have these right. hands. You can lift and carry with these hands. You can do things. And in fact, you might think that you are living a completely useless life, but when you hear that call, you will discover that utility. You will be able to do those things. Before we, before we go to audience questions, because it's already 640 somehow, um, I wanted to... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, we're, we're slightly hot. I mean, so we're a little high. I didn't, I don't know that I had enough, but I can have the rest now. <laughs> shall I, shall I everyone? You oh. shall. Oh. Um, I wondered, okay. Like just on a, on a craft level, do you take notes in the register of your finished works? Yeah. yeah. It's like literally exactly the same. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have probably like 15,000 more words of what is in this book that is just in the files and in my phone and that sort of thing. But it almost, it, it has to pop out almost like a grape, like you're spitting something out yeah. and it's totally intact. If not, then you're, you know, like spending months trying to work Rob Roy into your book and it's never going to fucking yeah. happen. But yeah, they, they, they come out pretty much that way. And if they don't, then a lot of times they're missing a sort of intactness. What about with criticism? That is more- It's the same energy. It's the same grape vibe. It's the same, but I wondered, I mean, how could that pot? I, I was guessing that it was like that for, for this, but- It's not quite the same. That yeah. is more like, that's the mercury feeling. That's yeah. the, the beads trying to come together. Gotcha. It's like playing with a, a fluid puzzle. And I think it's why I like to use so much of the, the writer's own, um, their own sentences, their own yeah. words, because those are the pieces to me and I'm sort of moving yeah. them around into a picture. But that part is similar. So the arrangement I would say is similar to the composition of something like no one is talking about this, but that the actual process is like hyper-focused to the point of insanity. Like writing yeah. that Bronte piece, like I should have been in the asylum and it's all yeah. I wanted to do. I was like, oh, I had an interview with the New York Times today. Go away. I'm thinking about Alfonso. Like I want- yeah what I want to be doing. I was so, so deeply absorbed in, in moving those pieces, not to my satisfaction, but according mm -hmm. to some magnet I felt yep. in the work. Um, it's, it's not like I form a thesis or anything like that. It's like I lay my reading out in a pattern mm -hmm. uh, that I think resembles, like, I don't know, the, the author's work, mm -hmm. in something like that, some topography. Do you have um, the, the fragmented format of, of no one's talking about this. Do you have any other, I was wondering if you had any other like operative structural metaphors for how the fragments have to work together. I feel like all writers have these private, like uh, To me, like when you ask me that, I'm, mo I'm moving something in my head. So it's not a metaphor. It's almost like a feeling of like the whoop or the zoom. It's moving things into place. Yeah. Um, but I would say that in terms of, of my view, it's more of like an anti view than yeah. it is like aerial or very far out in yeah. space. It's very, very, very close, which I think goes all the way back to like when I was a kid and I learned to read, I thought you had to hold the book like this close to your face. And I think that there's been- a Wait, well, Why did you think that? <laughs> I don't, well, I think that I needed glasses and I would tell my parents and they, they thought that I was like faking to get attention, which is uh -huh. not, not great, but you know, they're like- the, yeah kids do that sort of thing sometimes, but you know, so I had to hold it up really closely. And I think it just made more sense to me that way. So there's a sort of like productive myopia, I believe always in my reading and writing from the very beginning. Um, last question before we take audience questions. I haven't even looked. I hope these questions are good guys. Um, oh, we, oh, <laughs> were you supposed to be reading them? <laughs> no, 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 no. You are not supposed to do anything. Oh, you, right. you have you, a magic box where they are. I'm just sitting here holding the bat, <laughs> drinking my drugs, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, that bat, he's in great shape, you know? Who would have thought that he could have held so much COVID? For, it, just, yeah. it was like the Coke can, right? It's a very small area and he can just hold it all. Well, you're not on the internet right now, so maybe you wouldn't know about the Coke can. 
I don't know about the Coke can, actually. I'm yeah. having one of these moments. All of the world's coronavirus particles can fit into a Coke can. And there's like this image of it. Or I'm going to throw it, up. I'm it, sorry. It's like someone opening it and like the COVID comes out and it all <laughs> fits in the can. And this, a lot of people are having a hard time wrapping their minds around this or they don't want to wrap their minds around it. But they also all want to drink the Coke. I mean, oh it's- my. I'm. I'm like, having a really physical reaction. Also, I'm, I'm kind of having a fantasy right now of me being like in a nice, pleasant, like white padded room. And every day you open my little rat window and you tell me the, the what things the day. The things I, the day. I could yeah. probably do that. I could be like, all right, today there's a, a Coke can. It's an absolute <laughs> full of COVID. So just people are going wild. So just imagine <laughs> what they're thinking of. I can do that for you. What do you, then this is like a truly personal question about your, about your craft process. Yeah. What do you do when writing is not fun? Like when you're not able to, you know, cause I, I feel the same way that like, you know, you have to go where the electricity is. And when there's not electricity, it's really hard to generate it. And you can always tell in the work, but it's not always like that, right? Like, what do you, what do you do when you hit the wall where, you know, there's no coronavirus no, you know, no, coming out of the, yeah. out no, of the I, I am one of the people who I am of the opinion that you write on the day that you feel the juice like when you know the circuits closed and the electricity is going and if that's not how circuits work I don't need to hear from you about it because to me that metaphor works just fine but yes if I can feel the juice then I work and then otherwise it's I sort of let it go and I've noticed too that when I have a really good productive day I'll feel inclined to work the next day and I never get anything done yeah. So you have to sort of like take the days, the big chunky days where you, you do all of those things and just kind of take a little bit of a break afterwards. But it is different when you have a deadline. That's um, and then sometimes it's like really productive. You're like, I didn't want to work today. And then you end up doing it. So I don't know. Maybe yeah. I just talk myself out of my own methodology. <laughs> um, OK, I am going to go to some of the audience Q&A. So I became like so cold. So I'm going to put on my other shirt. The other shirt looks good. When you were trying it on earlier, I was thinking that that denim over shirt looks, looks great. Nice. Um, what is your first reading memory? Mm. Okay. So I don't have one because I learned to read when I was like three years old, but I think that I did this again, as I was talking about in a strictly pattern based sense. So I think that I could read words before I could attach any meaning to the words. And that might also have something to do with the way I work now, but no, I don't have, oh, I wish that I did that moment where like the, the meaning just, just, I don't have it either. Never fucking, yeah. when did you learn to read? Around the same yeah. age. So I think I, yeah, and I don't remember shit till I was like five. So you yeah. don't remember anything? In Not really. Life? I mean, I have vague sense memories, but I don't have episodic memories, really. It was just like images, right? Yeah. And also, it, it seems silly to have a memory of reading when that's all I ever do. I'm like, yeah. why would I need to have a memory of something that I'm doing right now? Checkmate. Right. It's like, I don't have a memory of fucking shitting for the first time because yeah. I'm Do I right have now. individual yeah. picking memories? No, I don't. I don't <laughs> yeah. have individual reading memories. People are always like, I was on a beautiful beach and I was reading Sally Rooney's book and my name is Shiv. Siobhan. She looks so good in that scene. She, so looks, she looks so good in that scene. Um, okay. Is yeah. there a Twitter thing from late 2020 slash early 2021 that will still hold up and be funny a year from now? The only thing I've thought on that was funny on the internet really over the last year personally is, is the gossip girl, go piss girl meme. But that was it for me. But only God knows what meme will be funny in a thousand years. Um, truly, <laughs> only God and Jesus Christ know that answer. Um, but, you know, I think that they will retain fragrances for us, right? I think that all of these things in the future, when you, you come back on them, there is there's something that comes to you that is almost like a fragrance. It is Proustian um, <laughs> in the most wholesome uh, sense of the word. But, yeah, it like... I guess I was really interested in writing this book too about the, the fact that people just forgot things. Yeah. I was writing all this down in my notebook and it, but it was just very, very easy to continue the downward slide and and to forget them just yeah. like a couple months after they happened. So. Right, like the guacamole transgression feels like the Spanish flu, you know? I mean, who or can the, remember? Fancy ham. And, you know, with things like that, I was like, well, you do have to put things in the book that people um, 
like who when they are reading it in 400 years because I'm that that's what's going to be happening with me the people are going to be reading this in 400 years they'll it'll still hold up in some way they don't have to know about like the actual op-eds but you can yeah. just imagine someone making a heinous substitution in guacamole and see how that would be funny so yeah. meet me halfway here guys yeah <laughs> um what are the drugs in the femur cup Okay, so this is, I was telling Gia beforehand, it's so sad. It's just like, it's a vet drug. It's just <laughs> dogs and cats. It's gabapentin. And I just take it um, for my neuropathy in my hands that I developed after COVID. I do feel like in my interviews, I've been like, ouch, my COVID. Like, oh, my COVID. <laughs> like, but yeah, so um, I'll have days where like, I can't use my hands very well or I can't type. Um, and I take the gabapentin. It also makes me quite chatty as you're noticing now. It's like, you're the, you're the friend in Anne of Green Gables Ruby, the one that dies of TB, but it's like, you know, you're just, but it's, it's just you clutching the gabapentin femur cup. Um, Maybe just say what an impression descriptions of tuberculosis consumption made on me. Like in my childhood reading, I'm like, wow, people, it sounds like they're getting very hectic, beautiful cheeks and shining eyes. Oh Maybe yeah. That's something I could go for a little Coke can full of. <laughs> <laughs> such like luscious description too like ruby's brilliant cheek. well she was the hot friend too also so that was you know, yeah and i'm sure she was stacked it. in my like yeah, she was she was stacked her. yeah right but it was like oh her, she, her little fingers were worked to the bone and she like laid down her needle she gave you the embroidery that she couldn't finish because it had grown so and, heavy and homely Anne sitting there on the couch <laughs> i know and um, well because the other one of course is in a tree grows in brooklyn and it's henny right mm -hmm. And that's like a little bit, that's more of a, I don't know, that's, that's a real death's head of a scene, which is actually quite good. All the people who like believe there's, there's not a whole lot of literary value in that book can go back and read that. That book is really, really good. I mean, it's, it's, it's so crystal clear. It's like, you're looking at, it's, I feel like I've gone, I go back to kids' books sometimes for, for that. Oh, I read kids' books almost constantly. You should read yeah. A Joy in the Morning. Um, I will. Another I will read this very soon. Um, there's an interesting question in here. Oh yeah. Which it's does self-awareness help or hinder with your writing? And it's an interesting question because I'm like, I guess it is possible to be so self-aware that it's paralysis, but it, uh, yeah, it's, what, how, what do you think about that question? So what I have, I think is maybe not awareness of myself. And in fact, most of the time, I don't know that I have a body, um, it, but it is awareness of my mind in the sense that I feel things falling through it or like beams of light shooting through it. And that is the awareness. And that's really helpful when you're a writer because that's like the main thing that you're supposed to be doing, I think. Um, but awareness of myself as a person is Trisha Lockwood, like, I'm like, who's that? You know, so I'm like, who's this bitch, Trisha Lockwood? There's nothing like that. I'm like, um, you know, in um, A Wrinkle in Time, when Meg's father is like trapped in the, the column, like the yeah. clothes and pine, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. where I'm at. And it's just things falling through here. Yeah. So in that sense, it's it's really more of an awareness of, of what is falling through me or what's filtering through me. Um, but yeah, like it is true that if my husband comes home, it's like, I, I won't even be a person. I'll have completely let any sense of how a person should behave, any awareness of that sense of self, all of that is gone. Yeah, I think uh, it's a writerly, I feel, I think that the feeling that I get not unpleasantly when I'm writing or often is just like, I'm a jellyfish. My brain's a jellyfish yeah. and it's sitting in a vat and that's yeah. it. And that, and that's really what my corporeal reality seems like to me. For There's me. that <laughs> when you're lucky. I have yeah, when you're lucky. That and you're just like the, the galaxy jellyfish. But yeah, 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 I think most of us feel like that. At least those of us who like have very strong reactions to the Muppets and whether or not they're dirty. They're I think dirty. That, like, we all have that sort of sense. Oh my God. I'm just trying to think about processing children's entertainment with the thought that anything in those universes could like could get dirty. degrade. I'm like, it's, it's very disturbing. I <laughs> very upsetting for him. Yeah. I'm not allowed um, to watch Muppet films in my house. So a question from Val. Um, I, re I appreciate the respect. This is Val speaking. I appreciate the respect that you are showing your niece by saying that you're not using her. Did you feel like you needed your family's permission to share this interpretation, your, your interpretation of this experience? Yes, I asked my sister right away when it was just all existing in, in notebook form. I did tell her that it, none of it had to see the light of day, but that I was I was writing about what we were experiencing almost compulsively. At that point, she had not yet been born. So 
that was a little bit more like I, I needed to talk to my actual sister about what was happening to her. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, her body at that point. And at, at that point, a lot of our concern was for what would happen to her, like right. the majority of our concern. And it became about something else later. But yes, um, my sister, it was very important for her to feel that people would not forget her daughter. Yeah. Um, because I, I do think there was already this idea that like, like what is a human life? Like what is a person? Um, who is the, the sort of person who rises to this level of, of, of worthiness of, of, you know, being called a human being? Like all of these were already like questions that other people, you know, like put to her situation. And that was something against which mm -hmm. like all of us fought, uh, I think every second she was alive and, and will continue to fight. But it was important for her that, that yeah, that the memory would continue in some way. And I, I do think the book helped with that. And if it had not been okay, I would not have done that. No, that would be psycho shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's really, yeah, I mean, that's really interesting that you're, that, so was it that during that period, people were trying to write the experience off as something that she would later get over or something? Definitely something like that. Or also, you know, something that was just about her and her freedom, which is definitely a consideration. But for her, you know, this is like she's in love with her child and, yeah. you know, she wants absolutely every minute for her. But it's unbelievable. Anyone who's been in a situation like this knows that like people say, really, really, really crazy stuff to you. So yeah, it, it was just more, I don't know, there was that, that kind of question that surrounded her, or this sense of, you know, like, ultimately, it, it would be better. Uh, nothing like that. Uh, did she want to, you know, penetrate like the sphere of thought that she had surrounding her child. And in that sphere, what you want is, is, is permanence for her, right? It's, it's, for her to continue and in the absence of that for her name to continue, I think. Um, this is another audience question that I had been meaning to ask about. And the story is, um, they say apologies if you don't wanna talk about this and if you don't, don't. Um, but they're saying the story is, part, is in part instigated by the lack of access to abortion. Has this, this experience affected or added to your thoughts on abortion at all? And like in late term, abortion is something that I have thought and written about a lot too. And there's a there's a part in the book that I meant to bring up where, you know, if this is taking place in Ohio, the story, and if the doctors had not been able to secure an exception to induce at 35 weeks, um, your, the sister might have died. Oh yeah. No, it wasn't even just that. It was the carrying the pregnancy was extremely dangerous for yeah. her. Um, my sister personally like was, was in a wheelchair, I think from like quite early on, like in, in sort of like 24 weeks, uh, yeah. 27 weeks onward. She was, because as soon as she would like start walking around, she would have contractions, but yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it absolutely informed it because even knowing what I did, even uh, being as up to date on what was going on in this country in terms of the erosion of abortion rights, there were things I did not know. And there were things that didn't even really seem to be on the books, uh, you know, this, this, <laughs> this like law about the felony um, that of, of inducing a pregnant woman before a certain date. I was like, oh, I didn't even know about this. So you do learn that you have to be more granular in your thinking um, against these things. And also this was a situation that like the pro-life people of my childhood had raised as like the, the ultimate boogeyman, right? So in a situation like this, uh, she probably would have had to have a specific kind of abortion that the people that I grew up among called a uh, partial birth abortion simply because of the situation. And we had just been raised with this idea that people would like do that for fun. And it was like, no, this is the actual situation where this would occur and it would be done to save the mother's life or her fertility. All yeah. of that in the abstract because it, it, it was not even a possible thing. Um, so I guess we've only got time for one more. Um, but so last question. you from Allie. You talked about the MySpace day for Twitter, aka the day unbeknownst to us that we log off for the last time. This is like a description of death. Very philosophical idea, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the day. Um, well, what do you hope that day on your Twitter feed looks like? Oh God, I hope, I hope he dies that day. Woo! 
I Me too. Life that day. That's good, right? At first I thought just like a white page and then I'm like, no, I hope he dies and we'll all be in the streets, right? Yep. The and day that I'll, I'll be on Twitter as well. Yeah. <laughs> that was why I logged on after he got coronavirus, hoping that he would die shitting and then I could... <laughs> it, perfect. it seemed very very close at that time it seemed it seemed very very close and it was just, it was all of them literally every person who like ever had the r after their name it was just like <laughs> you know, my first that day. one coke can and you see what it does to a oh god i'd forgotten about that <laughs> <laughs> um we, Happy release day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we could spend another hour or two listening to the two of you. Thank you so much. Um, so many thanks to Patricia Lockwood, Gia Tolentino, and our audience out there for your engaging and thoughtful questions. Your patronage and dedication really enable us to bring you these amazing discussions, and we wouldn't be able to do it without the book sales to support them. So go ahead and click in the link in the chat to get your copy of No One Is Talking About This or visit politics-pros.com. And while you're there, head over to our events calendar to see the latest and greatest. And from our shelves to yours, we hope you are out there staying strong, staying safe, staying well-read, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye.